Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sharsheret, the National Jewish Breast and Ovarian Cancer Community. And thank you for joining us for tonight's special webinar, Let's Talk About Men, Hereditary Cancer Risk and What It Means for You and Your Family. My name is Alana Silber, and I am the CEO of Sharsheret. I wanna to start tonight with thanking our very generous sponsors for tonight's program, the Department of Urologic Oncology at Hackensack Meridian Health, the Basser Center for BRCA, Azi, GSK, Merck, CGen, the Max and Anna Barron, Ben and Sarah Barron, and Milton Barron Endowment Fund of the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles, and the Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. Also, we're very grateful for the many organizations that have partnered on tonight's program, really emphasizing the importance of the subject matter for this evening. Thank you to ANCAN, Cancer Support Community, the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, FORCE, JSCREEN, the Male Breast Cancer Coalition, Men of Reform Judaism, the Minkoff Center for Jewish Genetics, the MSK Catch Program, and the Sarnoff Center for Jewish Genetics. Uh, please note that tonight's webinar will be recorded and we will post it on Sherrod's website along with a transcript. Your faces as the participants will not appear in the recording, nor will your names that appear on your Zoom box appear on the recording. You can remain co confidential. Uh, we received many, many questions in advance of tonight's program, and we are going to incorporate them into the conversation. But if at any point during the presentations you have a question, a general question, you can type it into the chat box, stay muted. We have a lot of people on the call tonight. Uh, so stay muted, type it into the chat, and we will do our best to address it by the end of the evening. If you have very specific questions, medical questions, we encourage you to reach out to your healthcare professional. And uh, just a reminder, and maybe for those of you who are new tonight, Sharsheret services and programs like tonight have always been delivered remotely uh, for the last 20 years, pre-COVID. And I'm pretty proud that in the last two years, we've actually enhanced our efforts and are providing support and education uh, remotely from anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We know that tonight we have people from all across the world joining us. Um, as we move into the webinar itself, I just want to remind you again, Sharsheret is a support an education organization. We do not provide medical advice. We do not perform medical procedures. What you hear tonight is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment or anything for a specific diagnosis or health condition. Again, always seek the advice of your physician or medical health provider with any questions regarding a medical condition. This is a good starting point to do something proactive for your health. We're gonna to start tonight's program with a personal story. We know that we learn really important information from the experts out there. And we also know that we learn from other people who are like us. We learn from their stories. They inspire us. And they also make complicated things just a little bit easier to understand. So tonight we're very fortunate to have Brad Hertz with us. Brad has served as president of the California Political Attorneys Association He's a frequent lecturer and author in the area of political and election law and has served on several nonprofit boards. In 2018, Brad unexpectedly learned that he carries a BRCH2 genetic mutation. And later he learned that his three adult children also carry the genetic mutation. Brad now splits his time between practicing law and being a men's health advocate, especially with regard to BRCA and other genetic mutations. I'm gonna turn the floor over to Brad. Please join me in welcoming Brad. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in 19, in uh, 2018, I learned that I carry the BRCA2 gene mutation. When on a whim, I completed a direct-to-consumer genetic test, mostly to learn about my ancestry. The discovery was not only a surprise, as no one in my family had the kinds of cancer associated with BRCA, but it was also life-changing. During the same time period, my wife of 30 years, who is not BRCA positive, was diagnosed with breast cancer, 
specifically invasive lobular carcinoma, and needed a double lumpectomy and radiation. Once I knew my wife was in the clear, I immediately started learning everything I could about BRCA, and Charcheret was an extremely valuable and supportive resource. I'm honored to be a Charcheret volunteer and to be helping with the expansion um, into the men's health area. I immediately became concerned about what my BRCA mutation would mean for me and for our three adult children, including our 27-year-old son, if they had the mutation. I felt a tremendous sense of responsibility to help them deal with whatever challenges they would face if they inherited my mutation. After more than a year of discussion with my wife and our doctors, including our geneticist, and because our oldest daughter was approaching 30, we decided to tell the kids about my situation. The Charcheret publication, How Do I Tell My Children About My Cancer Gene Mutation, was very helpful in this regard. As my son and I had lunch and talked about various issues, including his involvement in Hillel and his recent testing to see if he was a Tay-Sachs carrier, I told him I needed to discuss a health situation. I then said, I don't have cancer, but I do have an increased risk of cancer because I carry the BRCA2 gene mutation. This has become a signature line I use to kind of break the ice around the BRCA talk. Um, and it's somewhat serious, but also somewhat lighthearted. I think at that point he would have preferred a dad joke. His first concern was for me and what BRCA meant for me in terms of my health and wellness and longevity, and then asked if he should get tested. And we talked about the pros of knowing versus not knowing, the knowledge is power versus ignorance is bliss debate. A BRCA mutation is something no parent wants to pass on. Uh, but that's exactly what happened. As Alana mentioned, all three of our kids in their 20s decided to get tested and all three tested positive. So much for the 50-50 odds of passing on the gene. I not only needed to focus on my own health with frequent monitoring for prostate, breast, and pancreatic cancer, as well as melanoma, but then now to do everything in my power to help our son and our two daughters stay healthy. As unfortunate as this all may sound, a BRCA mutation is neither a death sentence nor a guarantee that any of us will ever get cancer. As we work together to process our new normal, our family has grown even closer. At age 58, I've scaled back my work as an attorney to devote more attention to my health, my family's health, and to battling BRCA on both a micro and macro level. Our son took the news in stride, did some research, and said he wasn't going to worry about it for now, but he wanted me to take better care of myself in terms of diet and exercise. He did say, however, that when he decides to have kids, he would want the embryos to be BRCA-free to prevent BRCA from being passed on <clears throat> to future generations. And if my wife and I could provide financial assistance with the in vitro fertilization and screening process, he would really appreciate it. He also said, don't worry, dad, if anything happens to you or mom, I'll be there for my sisters. We do our best to seize the day and live as if we don't have time bombs inside of us. We try to find the humor in the unusual situations we find ourselves in, and we appreciate every day that we are previvors and not patients. I hope cancer doesn't find me, but if it does, I want to be as prepared as possible by detecting it early and being in fighting shape, so I'll be more likely to beat it. And knowing that my kids have the mutation gives me another reason to take better care of myself and make even more of an effort to be there for them. Even though I'm just beginning my BRCA journey, I've already met hundreds of dedicated people whose work I admire and whose goals I share. As a man with a BRCA mutation, I have been welcomed into many support groups, including one called the BRCA Brotherhood, and which I have found to be incredibly helpful and inspirational. I wouldn't characterize it as misery loves company, but there is a bizarre in the trenches feel for my son and me, knowing that we have a 32% chance of developing prostate cancer compared to 12% for the general population and a 10% risk of pancreatic cancer compared to 1.5% for most men. 
Add to that a 7% risk of male breast cancer compared to 0.1% of the non-BRCA population, and the phrase carpe diem takes on a whole new meaning. I didn't go looking for BRCA, but since it found me and my family, I'm gonna do all that I can to meet it head on and to help others through education, advocacy, research, and every other way I can. Thank you for letting me share tonight. Brad, thank you so much uh, for sharing so personally, inspiring us and uh, making so many of us on the call tonight feel less alone as we grapple with these issues. I wanna remind everyone there is a transcript. I know you rattled off a ton of uh, data points and they're all really important and they will be available on transcript. So Brad, thank you for sharing and thank you for the good work you're doing for our community and, and helping to uh, save lives, not only your own family, but really caring for the community going above and beyond. So thank you, really appreciate thank that. Thank you. Um, and now we're gonna move forward to the experts that we have this evening. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us two uh, well-known and well-respected medical professionals from Hackensack Meridian Health with us tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Robert Alter, who serves as the co-division chief division of GU Oncology at the John Thor Cancer Center at Hackensack Meridian Health. And we have Dr. Michael Stifelman, who serves as chairman and professor of urology at Hackensack University Medical Center, Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine at Seton Hall. He is also the director of urologic oncology and the director of robotic surgery at Hackensack Meridian Health. Uh, this whole, thank you so much for coming on um, tonight and just throwing it out there that it also is Movember, a movement to raise awareness about men's health issues. So we are very timely to have these men with us. And just to round it out, we also have a genetic counselor on staff anticipating that we may get deep into genetics here. Uh, Peggy Cottrell, she is a certified genetic counselor who is at Charcheret and she consults with men, women, and families um, to answer individual questions about family history, genetic mutations, and risk for her cancer. We are going to post, and we are, we should be posting Peggy's contact information into the chat box. Uh, she's a resource for everyone here. You can reach out to her and find a time to speak with her um, after tonight's presentation. So thank you all for joining us for this conversation. And I'm calling it a conversation because that's what it's going to be. We hope to make this interactive so that you can learn the most um, from tonight's conversation. So the way it's gonna work tonight is I'm gonna ask some questions and the doctors are gonna come up with the answers. Um, but I'm gonna start and answer my first question because when we came out with this webinar a couple of months ago, the first question I got from people was, why is Sharsharet an organization that supports women and families facing breast cancer and ovarian cancer hosting a men's health webinar? Like, is this your department? You know, why are you guys doing this? And so the answer is that when it comes to hereditary cancer, which very much affects women facing breast and ovarian cancer, that's not the end of the story. It also affects men. This is not a Jewish women's issue. When we talk about BRCA and other genetic mutations, this is a Jewish family issue. It's a Jewish community issue, and it even extends <clears throat> beyond the Jewish community. So the answer is we're gonna focus a little bit on genetics. Um, and the genetics that we see associated, the cancers that are associated with these genetic mutations are prostate cancer, thus the doctors who have an expertise in urology, melanoma, pancreatic cancer, and male breast cancer. Um, so I think we're going to start with the first area of focus is understanding your risk. So Dr. Stifelman, I'm going to turn to you. Can you just give us um, the general population's risk for prostate cancer? Sure. So, you know, before I start, I just do want to thank you, Alana, and the rest of the team at Shark Jarrett for bringing this to the forefront and to attention. It's such an important topic. And I hope your wives are here listening with you because I think sometimes when you have couples together, they hear things better and we get better execution. Um, your, I believe your question was that what's the general risk for prostate cancer? Um, it's about, there's different numbers that are out there. I think Brad said 18%, some have said 12%, uh, 20%, but really it's about 18%. One in eight men in their lifetime will deal with prostate cancer. 
And can you explain how you stratify <clears throat> prostate cancer and what, why that stratification is so important? I think that is probably the most important take-home message. One of the most important take-home messages tonight is it's not, prostate cancer is not binary. It's not, oh, I have prostate cancer and it's all the same. It's a spectrum. And it, what we do is using um, the pathology report, what, the, what these cancer cells look like under the microscope, PSA, what their prostate, their uh, PSA antigen was at the time of diagnosis. Sometimes we use MRI. Um, sometimes we use somatic genetic malformations as well as hereditary malformations. We take all this information that we get when we diagnose someone and we put them into one of five categories, very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk with uh, favorable, non-favorable, and then finally high risk. And why that's so important is it really dictates on how we treat that patient. For those very low and low risk patients, we often do nothing. We just wanna just use active surveillance. That's really the best option for them. Whereas for those intermediate and high risk patients, we're gonna to need to be more aggressive. And so understanding that stratification uh, is really the first step to understanding the disease and how to manage it. So you talked about average risk and then you mentioned high risk. What are the factors that make a man high risk? Is there a relationship with age? We've heard that. What, what makes someone high risk? It's, it's really not age so much. Um, it's really has to do with the cancer cells themselves, what they look like under the microscope. It has to do with what their PSA was, that presentation. So for example, someone with Gleason or a, a grade grouping four and five, those are a very high abnormal looking cancer cells. That makes them high risk. Someone with a PSA over 20 at time of presentation, that makes them at high risk. Someone with BRCA2 actually also puts them at a higher risk um, because we know those cancers tend to be more aggressive. And there's some somatic genes as well that we look for to see if someone is more apt to be high risk. So it's a constellation of uh, different information that helps us stratify that. So what are the chances of being a carrier of a genetic mutation that puts someone in that high risk category? What is the chance of carrying that mutation? It's relatively low. Um, I, I'll probably refer to Bobby for the exact number, but I think it's about the general population is probably around one or two percent. I think for the Ashkenazi Jew, it goes up to about five or eight, five percent or so. So it's still relatively low. But when we find and we take a really good family history um, and we recognize that they have that potential for risk or having potential for the BRCA gene, BRCA2 specifically, we want to look for that and we want to test for that because that does go into the equation on treatment options. And we've talked about a number of different genetic mutations, different cancers. So when someone comes to you and they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, is there any reason to do genetic testing or screening for other cancers? You know, what do you recommend? So um, I think it's really important. Not everyone understands this. There's something called somatic genetic testing. And then there's hereditary genetic testing. And those are two very different areas um, and really very, very different. So in, maybe in terms of somatic genes, that, those are things that happen to, that help form the cancer. So that means it's, it happened in your body, this genetic abnormality occurred. Um, you're not gonna be able to pass it on to your children. It just happened to you. And your cancer has these somatic mutations in it. And when we look and find certain somatic mutations that happen you know, to your cancer cells, that dictates if they're gonna be more high risk. Then there's the hereditary. That's stuff that's passed on generation after generation. And, we look, and that's a different test. Uh, we use different tools to use that. It's typically a blood test, sometimes a saliva test. And for that, those can get passed on generation to generation. And those also many times will confer an increased risk for having more aggressive cancer, as well as an increased risk for developing the cancer and for your children to develop, you know, one of the four cancers mentioned. Uh, for men, it's really prostate's number one, pancreas melanoma, and obviously for women, it's breast. So I'm gonna turn a little bit towards Dr. Alter as we dive into these hereditary, uh, the hereditary genetics piece. So. Just to remind everyone, I don't even know if everyone on the call tonight, um, Dr. Walter knows 
what is a BRCA, BRCA mutation? And what are other genetic mutations that just people should recognize their names? Maybe they can mention it when they go to the doctor. Just give us like the two second version of what a BRCA mutation is. Oh, well, uh, first of all, thank you, Alon, for having me included in this program um, and to the whole staff list as well. Um, so BRCA really just stands for breast cancer. It's an abbreviation of the word. Uh, and there's two genes. There's uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which is breast cancer gene 1 and breast cancer gene 2. Uh, these are genes that produce proteins that help repair um, damaged DNA in your body. It's like an automatic repair mechanism. If any of these genes are mutated, uh, the DNA damage cannot be corrected uh, or repaired correctly. As the damage accumulates, these cells become more prone to forming cancer. Uh, as Dr. Steffen said, you know, there are pretty much two sets of uh, mutations. Germline, uh, again, I'm just repeating what he said, germline is just really, it's inherited. Um, that means the mutation is in every cell of your body. Um, so that's why you can do a blood test, you can do a nasal swab, a saliva test, it just is everywhere. Um, and that has a direct uh, genetic uh, predisposition. So that'll be uh, handed down to children by 50% chance. And then there's somatic, which is an inherited process, something that well, you are not born with, so it is present just in that organ itself. So um, if some people have a somatic mutation and they do a blood test and it comes back negative, the implications that they don't have prostate cancer is false. So again, a lot of these uh, kits and depends on, we can talk about that later, but ultimately it comes down to doing, is doing the right uh, study. And there are several companies that have excellent studies in looking at not only somatic, but germline uh, mutations. And I think that's quite important when it comes down to um, who uh, performs these tests as compared to using direct consumer uh, studies. So it truly is this um, mutation uh, that forms the risk of cancer. And as uh, Dr. Steffman was saying, um, the risk can vary. Uh, BRCA2 is a much more aggressive uh, tumor than BRCA1. Um, BRCA2 has been proven to be an aggressive tumor. It happens uh, in men who are younger ages. Um, and actually, there was a study that was performed that was presented, I think, two years ago that actually transformed how we screen uh, patients. It used to be um, BRCA had no implications in regards to early screening for prostate cancer in men. Uh, and the study, which I think uh, accrued more than actually close to 3,000 patients, 20 different countries, ages 45 to 59, and identified people who are BRCA1 and BRCA2 um, compared to um, a control. Uh, and they realized that patients with BRCA2 um, have a significant risk, so much so that it changed uh, the screening um, for patients with prostate cancer, or actually patients for prostate disease. Uh, down from the age of 50, then initially down to 45. In this study, if you're bracket two, they would recommend that you actually have prostate ca cancer screening at the age of 40. Um, but it really is trying to identify the mutation, uh, which identifies the risk and then the ripple effect about how one acts upon those risk factors. So we're talking about this mutation and knowing that you have a mutation, but what about families that have a strong family history, but they test negative for genetic mutations? So it ends up being that if you um, have a strong family history and you, and you test negative, we call that a true negative. That means the risk of getting uh, uh, cancer by BRCA is, it's non-existent. Uh, you have the same risk of developing cancer as you would have the general population. Um, so I think that's an important test to do, but that all falls into the play of having a family history of patients who are, are BRCA positive. If there is an unknown, you know, some people just automatically get testing on their own, you know, 23andMe, other tests, and they get BRCA tested and they do not know what their family history um, is. So let's say someone has no family history of, of cancer, BRCA or not, and and they get themselves tested and they're negative, you still don't know if they're just a true negative or if they're just a you know, un, unpredictable, as they would say, and therefore they can still pass that gene on to other family members uh, genetically. But if you test positive um, from, a patient, from a family who tests positive, obviously it has some deleterious effects. The concerns, of course, are you yourself. Testing positive does not mean you will develop cancer. Testing positive means you potentially can develop cancer and cannot tell you whether you will or when you will develop cancer. Um, but it has a positive effect on the people around you. Obviously, um, first and second degree relatives, um, the family history is very important when you speak to them. And I think the geneticists will definitely talk about that. But when it comes to um, the effect it has upon you, obviously the 50% transmission to your 
uh, next generation, and then what effect it has to your siblings uh, in regards to now putting them at a knowledgeable uh, point that they now have to be concerned about. They are themselves at risk. And, you know, we'd always say if one actually tests themselves and they are uh, negative, you should still test, if you can, the previous generation of your parent to see what they are as well, to see what kind of risks are for your children as well as for your siblings. And I don't know if you mentioned this, but is there a certain age if a young man should consider genetic screening if they know that they have a parent who carries, a, you know, a BRCA gene kind of like in Brad's situation? Is there a minimum? Um, yeah, so right now the recommendation is at the age of 40. Um, if by identifying the risk factors, you can actually justify um, doing it younger. They actually say um, it should be done 10 years younger to when the previous person has had prostate cancer. If someone has a prostate cancer in your family, have a diagnosis at the age of 42, then you should be getting tested at the age of 32. Um, they're trying to have a push now about having uh, people uh, uh, tested uh, between the ages of 18 and 25. Um, it's controversial. Uh, this has to be definitely discussed with the geneticist. And I would say you definitely need to have pre and post counseling prior to having that study done. I think that um, even going to a healthcare provider, the, the final answer may not be known. And I would truly implore anyone who's going to consider doing it at a younger age to have to have a geneticist discuss them. Because it's not just about BRCA, you have to talk about other conditions. And we mentioned, you know, there's a Lynch syndrome, there's Lee for many syndrome, there are other symptoms that are associated with other conditions in addition to uh, prostate cancer. We always assume BRCA1 and BRCA2 is going to be prostate, and BRCA2 is mostly with uh, male breast cancer as well. We didn't talk about that yet. Um, pancreatic cancer and melanoma, um, but there can be some association with some colon cancers as well. It depends on the other syndromes, but BRCA1 and BRCA2 are usually not associated with colon cancer. But um, again, I think that uh, people just testing, testing out their ethnicity and you know what their genetic makeup may be, you know, be cautious about the implications about doing a study that, you know, what do you do with the information once you know it? And I think that's where healthcare providers can help, but I really think geneticists can be of significant importance. Yeah, I want to bring in Peggy for a second, just because I know we spend a lot of time and we are talking about hereditary cancer tonight. But as for everyone on the screen, I want them to understand, Peggy, I know there's a certain statistic of how many cancers that are diagnosed actually are, can be actually tracked to a specific genetic mutation. What is, what is that percentage of cancers that are being diagnosed that are associated with a genetic mutation and how many are not, just so that people on the call understand? Uh, well, there are cancers that are related to the genetic mutations that we can identify that are inherited, like um, the ones we've been mentioning, prostate, male breast, pancreatic, melanoma. Uh, but sometimes cancers are running in a family and they're related to mutations that we don't know how to look for yet. And so if we see someone has a strong family history and the genetic testing is negative, then it's really important to follow them and screen them carefully as if it's possible that there's something inherited there, uh, just in case. But is it true, like I've heard, only five to 10% of cancers diagnosed really are associated, with, that are associated with a genetic mutation we know. So that means that 90% of cancers that are diagnosed cannot be attributed today to a specific mutation. Is that true? Right, so most people who get cancer don't have anything inherited that's causing it and it's happening for mostly for reasons we can't explain. There are risk factors associated with exposures, um, with lifestyle factors, um, but a big part of it is chance. Um, and so anyone can get cancer. Right. I, I wanted to put that out there so that I know and this is this calls for everybody out there. Um, I also wanted to shift gears just for a minute and then we're gonna get back to screening for cancer and the signs and symptoms. But before we do that, um, Sharsharit is an organization that focuses a lot on the psychosocial issues related to being diagnosed or carrying a genetic mutation. These are very serious issues and family issues. So Dr. Stifelman, I wonder if you can give us some insight on this emotional piece. Like, are there any tips or, you know, there are people definitely on the call tonight who may have young adult sons and want to know how to start this conversation with their family. I know Brad gave his perspective are there tips or things that people can do to, to have this conversation? It's hard. I, I think in all honesty, Brad probably uh, could give us the best insight because he's gone through it. And he, ha I think he did a phenomenal job uh, the way he explained it, the way he brought his kids, you know, one by one 
um, went over what it means, had the information at hand, um, you know, explained to them when, the, when we should start testing um, and it's really not ignoring it or putting your head in the sand, but really confronting it head on. So I, I really, uh, I really would just echo what, what Brad did, which is, it is very emotional. Um, it, and, but I think when you come armed with the information that Sharshare can provide you, um, and you do that and present that information in a sort of non-biased, non-emotional way, it's probably, I would, I would say that would be my advice to do it. Um, and just like it's been said a hundred times, just because you're BRCA2, you know, if you're going to go to Las Vegas, you're going to win 75% of the time that you're not getting breast cancer or, I mean, or prostate cancer. So it's pretty good odds, you know, the odds are still in your favor. So, but it also means that we can't ignore it and we need to start testing earlier than we would have um, for others. So that's in a nutshell would be my advice. Okay, and, and I, I can speak to that a little bit. So I think a lot depends of course on the age of the kids and the maturity level of the kids. I kind of interviewed my children after the process, like how could we have done it better? Um, they ended up finding out at different times and they were troubled by that because we asked, like, for example, our son to not tell his sisters quite yet because he kind of figured it out because he's very involved in, in Jewish issues. And anyway, um, upon retrospect, they said, we would have wanted you to tell all of us together and we would have wanted you to get right to the point and not do a lot of editorializing, be very factual, and then be quiet and let us ask questions. And if we didn't want to ask questions right then and there, let us deal with it and come back and ask questions later. So I thought that was very mature and, and they didn't have any resentment or you know jump off a cliff or any of the things we worried about. They handled it really well and, and hopefully that's a credit to them, but I think most kids would. Right. No, I appreciate that. And obviously every family is very individual. We do, uh, Peggy speaks with, you know, hundreds of people every day and families and setting up calls. So this is a resource that anyone can take advantage of. Everything is free, everything's confidential and everything's convenient from your home. So I encourage anyone who's struggling with uh, the right uh, background situation, conversation. We have a lot of experience with that. We also have a resource that Brad referred to in the beginning, but these are conversations that you can turn to share to help you have them. So um, Alana, I'm gonna go off topic for a second, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, that's a little scary just because, you know, Shar Sharon sticks to the time, but but go take a risk. Let's see what happens. So I actually want to ask this question for Peggy because I get this question a lot. And that is, where should I have my genetic testing done? Is doing a genetic test from 20, you know, one of me or from one of those other uh, commercial sites as good as going to a genetic counselor and having it done uh, through a hospital lab or through, you know, industry lab? What do you recommend, Peggy? Uh, so we definitely recommend that uh, people use a genetic counselor for their testing. Um, the type of testing that's done um, at 23andMe or Ancestry uh, is certainly interesting if you want to find out about Ancestry or long lost relatives, but it's not really a medical grade test. And even those sites will tell you that any health information you learn from them has to be confirmed by a medical grade site. Yeah. But there are some, you know, sometimes people want to do a test without meeting with a genetic counselor and there are some quality tests that are available. There's uh, what's called consumer initiated testing, which can be done um, at Invite, at Color, um, and at JScreen. And we, I've often been recommending JScreen these days. They have a very good price. Uh, right now for people to get a comprehensive medical grade um, test done. And so if people would like to pursue something like that, they can certainly be in touch with me. We have a uh, coupon code right now with JScreen that makes it very affordable. So, so what you're saying is if you have number one choice would be do it through a genetic counselor. Number two is if you're not going to do that, do it through JScreen or a medical grade. And really right. the, the least favorable choice is just going out and doing a 23andMe or Ancestry. Right. Okay, thank you. Because 23andMe is gonna miss most of the inherited mutations that are there. It's only looking at founder mutations 
in the Ashkenazi population in BRCA1 and 2. So it's going to miss so much of what could be identified. Great, now. great take home message. Thank you. And, you and I agree with that because not only that, but you're also, what do you do if you're a consumer? You do a test by yourself and you get the results and you hold on to it. And I mean, at that juncture, you should be educated enough to share that not only with the geneticist and definitely a primary healthcare provider, but with a family. And I just wonder if people panic when they get the results and then shut down. And we've seen that in one of our patients. And again, um, we have an excellent gen geneticist at, at, uh, at the John Thurow Cancer Center. So, I mean, we just sort of, it's easy just to hand it to people who are professionally recognizing that it's just, just not one disease, it's not just one gene, that there's a whole effect that has to be done. And I think the family history is quite important. Yeah, that's, that's, the, we, that's the message that we send all the time. And I, I'm really happy that you did break from the tight uh, schedule that we have, though. And that's really important. And, um, and, and Peggy also can share more information about accessing genetic testing, affordable, accurate, and reliable genetic testing, along with the important conversations, because these are complicated results and they don't just affect you, they affect your entire family. So these are important. Um, Okay, we're gonna move into this screening for cancer. We talked about screening for genetics. We're gonna also talk about screening for cancer and signs and symptoms. Um, because these are, this is practical. Let's pay attention what we can do today, tonight, tomorrow. Sure. So um, Dr. Stifelman, I'm gonna start with you. Okay. Um, what are the routine prostate screening recommendations for men at average risk versus those who are at high risk? I think you kind of mentioned some of them, so you can just, so what's what's inc what, what's incredible is that this is actually controversial. Um, that there is, you know, there are the organizations that have come out and actually have gone as far as saying we should not be screening for prostate cancer. That has been somewhat reduced in terms of the messaging. And really, what we need, what we are told, and what I'm going to tell you is that it's a conversation that you have to have with your primary care doctor or your urologist, should I even be screened? You know, what does that mean being screened and what do I do with that information? Um, a short answer is 55 to 75 or 55 to 70. Like average men should be getting screened at age 55. And if you haven't gotten prostate cancer about 70, and if you're really healthy, probably 75, you can stop and no longer worry about it. Um, but there are some of the governmental agencies that have even gone as far as suggesting that we don't need to screen, it's not worth it. Um, we have found in the last five years, uh, actually it's been 10 years since that, in, that information's come out through the Defense Force uh, Task Force, that we've actually seen an uptick, a significant rise in high-grade prostate cancer. So I would uh, push back on that and I would recommend everybody every man gets screened starting age 55. If you have a history or you're at high risk for prostate cancer, right? So if you're an Afro-American man, um, if you have a strong family history, even without the BRCA2 gene, if you have a BRCA2 gene uh, in your family and or you have a BRCA2 gene yourself, um, then I would get screened at age 40. And that's when we recommend it. So 40 um, for high risk of getting cancer, 55 if you aren't general population. And screening involves two things. Um, it involves a blood test, which is a PSA, um, and it involves a rectal exam. And those are those go hand in hand. You shouldn't do one without the other. And I know it's, it's um, not every man wants to hear that, but that is really what the recommendation is because there are times we find uh, bad, bad cancers just by palpation, not by uh, PSA. So that's the screening recommendations. That's when you do it when you're young. And those are the two tests that you should be getting done uh, when you start screening. Okay, and Dr. Alter, uh, can you go over a little bit of the symptoms for, for well, we're talking about prostate cancer, right? The most common cancer for men, maybe the other ones we could touch upon also, but what point, what are the symptoms and at what point do we pick up the phone and call the doctor? Um, well, I would say the symptoms could be no symptoms whatsoever, uh, which is unfortunate, but it can be urinary issues. Uh, it could be having blood in the urine, it could be blood in the semen. Um, it could be uh, pain, unfortunately. Sometimes people first get uh, recognized of their cancer after they already started to travel to adjacent lymph nodes. Um, 
So, you know, and Dr. Stackman probably sees his patients on a routine basis. I usually see them after they've been diagnosed, but the, the urinary symptoms are usually what uh, can lead to it. But sometimes it's just more urinary difficulty. Um, again, you know, as the prostate enlarges, the urine stream gets a little bit more decreased. Um, and they just have a, a decreased stream, increase in urinary frequency, um, waking up at night and going to the bathroom just because they're not emptying their bladder well. Um, and it may be as subtle as that, and there's a, a lag time, Dr. Seifman can tell you this, about when these symptoms first be initiated to when they, they first present to their primary care physician and then eventually to a urologist. Um, but the, symptom, the symptoms may just be mild and then fleeting as compared to being persistent. And again, sometimes they're asymptomatic, which then goes back to if you've identified that there is a, a hereditary concern when screening should happen sooner. And just to sort of add to that, give a little more color, maybe again, um, I hope everyone's okay with this this late at night. If you think of the prostate like a walnut or like a, a, an orange, most of the cancers happen on the outside, the periphery. The urethra goes right through the walnut, right through the middle. And so BPH, so much stands for benign prostatic hypertrophy, benign condition, but the prostate starts to growing. Those can't, that disease, that prostate tends to cause symptoms, frequency, urgency, having difficult urinary like doctor alter set. Whereas cancers of the prostate, because they're on the outside of the prostate, the majority of time, 80, 85% of the time, those often don't have any symptoms. And it just happens to be they have a combination of prostate cancer and BPH, but the prostate cancer itself, especially in the localized early fit to, uh, detection, which is what we always strive to um, diagnose them with, have very little, often will have no symptoms at all. Similar like breast cancer or even kidney cancer. These, those cancers were found incidentally. They were found because you went back your mammogram or you got an ultrasound for your gallbladder and you found something on your left kidney. Um, it's really when they become mm -hmm. advanced, when they become um, you know, met metastasized, um, do they start to present with symptoms. And that's when Dr. Alter unfortunately sees many of those patients. I happen to see them, thank luckily, much, much earlier. Uh, but Alana, let me jump up and say that, you know, when we talk about patients who are BRCA positive, I think sometimes um, that may lead to it. So, I mean, when we sometimes talk to patients about hereditary cancer testing. You know, first of all, a patient uh, themselves have, let's say, prostate cancer, we would then have them do BRCA because they still may be at risk of developing another BRCA-associated cancer like breast cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, or melanoma. So, you know, a person's personal history that would lead to more testing. Uh, if you have a family history or by ancestry, if you have one or greater close relatives who have breast cancer before the age of 50, anytime you have uh, ovarian or pancreatic cancer um, or metastatic breast cancer, obviously we see increasing more bracket testing and identifying um, any family history of BRCA positivity leads to more testing. Um, if you have greater than two close relatives who had either prostate or breast cancer, first, second, or third cousins, um, this puts anyone at risk as well. And then um, Ashkenazi Jews uh, definitely have uh, more of a link. Um, and that can easily be, there was actually an article I read that um, if you're between the ages of 18 and 25 and you have a grandparent uh, who's Ashkenazi, it even justifies getting yourself bracket pass, uh, tested, which again, I have to say is an article, not the standard of care. Um, but I think all these uh, screening tools uh, would be able to sometimes identify these patients with prostate cancer uh, risk as compared to having prostate cancer itself. Yeah, and I think that's an important point that we try to share that when men go to the doctor and they have to share their family cancer history, that they should also be including the female cancers that females in their families have had that can identify. Sometimes they think they just have to know their males, their family history, but also breast cancer and ovarian cancer can increase their risk for other cancers. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, I know we're getting close on time and I'm mindful of everyone's schedule. So I want to get to some, um, a couple of things. I know there's questions about pancreatic cancer that is more complicated with screening than prostate cancer. I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but we're certainly going to have information going forward about the other cancers that Dr. Alter mentioned that are very much associated with these cancer um, genetic mutations like uh, pancreatic cancer and melanoma and male breast cancer and um, and and we will get to those at a future date. But questions? Can I, can, I can cover that. I can cover that in two sentences. So then do it. Go. 
Um, for any risk, if you have a BRCA positivity, um, see a physician, close uh, monitoring, you know, healthcare providers are doing PSA is one, neurology may be another, but you should be seeing a dermatologist yearly for the, for the risk of melanoma. Um, if they can have pancreatic cancer, uh, there's a issue of endoscopic ultrasounds being the gastroenterologist again spoken to them. And if you have BRCA positivity, men should get mammograms uh, starting at the age of 40 or 45. And this still is the same risk that you have uh, that women have if they're BRCA positive. So I think it just sort of, you know, we have to recognize that men can get mammograms the same way women get mammograms. Uh, the difference about men is the fact is that men cannot go for MRIs as women can do. It's not as sensitive. Um, there's no real um, prophylactic surgery that men can undergo. Uh, if they identify that they're BRCA positive, and there's no real medication one can take to prevent it as there are for women with breast cancer. So <laughs> I think to, to summarize, be in touch with your primary care physician, let them identify if there are guidelines that one can abide by. Uh, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network has submitted guidelines that we should be partaking in. And you know, there are clinical trials as well, if you wish to partake in that in regards to genetic screening. So I think these are important ways of just really communicating the information to your physician. Yeah, and then Sharshard has resources on clinical trials and other things. And I know that we are going to try to open up. I know a lot of people are asking me behind the scenes if we're going to have time for Q&A, which I know is the best part of the event. I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer if, if, if the experts on the screen sure. will address some of the questions. If they get too specific, we won't get to them. But right before we get to the Q&A, um, I want to talk about next steps. I mean, there are two things I really want to talk about advances in treatment for prostate cancer, but I don't know if we'll have time for that. Is there something specific new coming down the pike that people should know um, about a new treatment in prostate cancer, or is there nothing new to report on tonight? But if there's something new, we want to be able to tell everybody. So I'll jump into the local uh, treatment, localized treatment for prostate cancer, and I'm sure Bobby will hit some of the really exciting uh, treatments that are coming out for advance. So I think the thing that's most exciting is our use of active surveillance for prostate cancer. It's the no treatment. It's identifying patients who don't need treatment and stop treating them because they just don't need it. It's not going to hurt them. To me, that's the most exciting thing that's come out, Alana, in the last five or 10 years is this big push and understanding that active surveillance for men is a very good option for those low and very low risk prostate cancer patients. In terms of some local therapies, we've gone a long way with stuff called vocal ablation, meaning just treating part of the prostate, sort of like a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. Um, and we have the specific patients that we can offer that to. It's not for everyone. And then finally, in terms of the surgical approaches, um, we've gotten this operation down to basically making one, you know, incision the size of your thumb in your belly button and doing the whole thing robotically uh, through a one inch incision. Uh, and with getting some really, really good results. And also we're using some regenerative medicine techniques to help with functional outcomes as well. So I think there's a tremendous amount of exciting things happening at the John Thera Cancer Center and the Urologic Oncology Department, HMH, uh, and really leading the way and pioneering a lot of this. Bobby? Um, so thank you. I would say the, the good old fashioned hormone manipulation, hormone therapy to suppress prostate cancer similar to how women get treated with uh, breast cancer. Um, there are chemotherapy agents as well, not too many as compared to other diseases. Um, and I guess the newest advancement is something that was presented in June at the oncology meetings, uh, something called uh, Lutetium PSMA 617, uh, which is actually it delivers a beta particle radiation um, to a prostate binding target. Um, it, it targets the, the markers expressed by tumors in combination with, um, with the radioactive um, uh, isotope. Uh, and this approach to the targeted delivery of radiation to the tumor and disease surrounding microenvironment while eliminating toxicities to um, the surrounding healthy tissues. Uh, the, data, the data that was presented uh, shows improvement in postponing progression of cancer and improving overall survival, which is uh, a tremendous step in our, I guess it's been relatively stale in prostate cancer therapies. Uh, again, moving forward now using um, radioisotopes. And I, mean, I think that in a very harmless to... way, it seems very effective. I mean, just I want to just restate what he said, maybe in layman's terms, because that was a lot of information. But I just want you to sort of understand what Bobby said. We are getting to the point that we have the ability to give uh, a, a basically nuclear medicine, a radioisotope that you inject into your arm 
that only goes to prostate cancer. That's the only place it touches. And then we connect that radioisotope, a drug to kill the prostate cancer. I mean, if we're not talking about futuristic medicine and patient-centric medicine, um, I, I don't know what else is. We, we can now, we're getting to the point where we can target those cancer cells through these specialized nucleotides and, and put drugs onto them to kill them. That's amazing. And uh, that to us, I know for Bobby too, is extremely exciting. And we look forward to the research that's coming out on that. Okay, thank you for uh, the clarification and uh, the emphasis on the importance. It's, it, this is good information. Um, and again, just a reminder of everyone, we're gonna have a transcript. And um, you know, I think people walking away from the program tonight want to know what next steps are. So if we had to say, you know, a couple of things that people can do tonight, maybe a certain question to ask their doctors or certain things they should be looking out for, like each one of you, if you can give us one or two, like do this right away, that would be really helpful. Be proactive about their health. Bobby, we're gonna start with Bobby. Uh, proactivity. So I think we have to try to recognize what we can actually do. So if we're born with the genes we have, I think we have to embrace them. But I think we have to try to be healthy in how we take care of ourselves. So um, I think is, first of all, seeing a physician on a regular basis. I think it may be esoteric and redundant, but I think it's quite important. Um, eating healthy, um, fruits, vegetables, um, no saturated fats, and you know, trying to uh, really limit the amount of sugar you have. Um, uh, no smoking. If you're smoking, please stop smoking. I think you're harming yourself and other people around you. Um, if you get a drink, then limit the amount that you're drinking. And uh, moderate to vigorous exercise on a daily basis, I think, can improve it. So I think these are all ways, uh, if I tell you this is about a cancer talk or just about a good old general passion medical talk, um, there really is nothing better to do in regards to improving your health than just those basic examples. But to talk about how to improve a specific disease fashion that I don't have the advice on, I would simply say to you, um, just whatever you're doing, you have guilt about, try not to have guilt. Um, so in terms, I would just add three other things to that. Um, number one is obesity. You know, it goes along with everything that uh, Bobby said, but obesity clearly has a link to prostate cancer. Um, when you have obesity, you basically, it's a tug of war between your body and the cancer cells and the cancer cells always win and they're getting all the nutrients and they're going to grow more. And so that is something really important to be careful of. Um, number two, these are three things that are being looked at. This is not, you know, for prime time, but these are three different, um, medications that are being looked at that may reduce the risk. Again, may, this is not, you know, FDA approved in any way, but they are looking at using very low doses of metformin, using Lipitor and certain vitamins to help reduce the risk. But again, those are experimental and they have not come out. And I think the most important thing um, is just having a conversation with your physician and telling them that you want to be proactive. Um, I'm hoping you are. That's why you're here. And you want to be start testing for prostate cancer because it's the number one killer of men. Uh, number one cancer death of men is prostate cancer. And so uh, based on your risk stratification, you want to start that testing either at 40 or 55 and you want to be proactive. I think those, if you do those things, you have your best shot. Thank you. I also, you know, I've seen a ton of questions coming into the chat. A lot of them were included in the presentations. Um, I know that there was also a lot of connections between people on the chat, which we actually love. And it's a great opportunity to connect with the community. I just want to, full disclosure, there's a lot of information in the chat that's conflicting, contradictory, not necessarily from healthcare professionals. So just a reminder that if you have a question and really specific um, and you want additional information, you can reach out to us, you can speak to Peggy and or speak to your doctor. Do not rely on the chat. People are very passionate and we so appreciate that. And, um, and the information you're sharing is important and this should be a springboard for conversation and not taken as medical advice. I just wanna really put it out there because I'm excited about the participation but want you to do the right thing. So that's the one thing, that's my takeaway. Do not take this chat with you as, as your medical decisions. You take it and take it to your doctors and ask the questions or, or reach out to us. We can also share that. Um, 
there were a lot of questions that came in. I, you know, I, I turn to my team and say, do we stay on or, or, or we end it? I, I, I just think there's just so many questions out there. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them. Um, there is just, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of specific things. Um, and I just, I really don't even know where to start. So, so we got 10 minutes, Alana, pick five questions. Let's do it. Okay. So of course I have to scroll down in my chat because it's just so unless uh, anyone else, Peggy's looked through it or maybe so Peggy's Brad. Been answering along the way, which has been awesome. So thank you, Peggy. Um, there was one thing that someone asked that I never, that I really don't know the answer to. So, um, and this is for Dr. Stifelman. Can you ask, um, can you answer what the 4K test is as opposed to PSA? Did you say that and I miss it or is that? No, we didn't, you know, and so, you know, one of the things that urologists are trying to do is determine who actually needs a biopsy, right? Because PSA is a, is, this is going to take me longer than two minutes. PSA is sort of a misnomer. It's been called prostate specific antigen. It has nothing to do with an antigen. It's a protein that your prostate makes. And it actually has a function to basically liquefy semen. So it's just a protein. And lots of things can raise your PSA. Infection can raise your PSA. Just having a big prostate can raise your PSA. Ride a bicycle extensively for a period of time. Many, many things can raise it. And so in an attempt to better clarify when a PSA is bad from badness or because of just BPH, we've come up with other tests and other techniques. And one of those is 4K. It uses both PSA and something called calicarins they look at, which also has a higher risk being associated with prostate cancer. That's a good uh, test. We, I typically use that only on patients who've had a negative biopsy, but uh, continue to have an elevated PSA after that. But there's different ways of using it. There's a company called a Phi score, which you could use it. There's PSA density, PSA velocity, but all of these different tests are designed to try to help the urologist decide who actually needs a biopsy or not. And that's, again, a conversation that you're going to need to have with your physician based on a lot of different parameters. So right now, I can't say one is 100% better than the other, um, but they do are all designed to try to make PSA more specific. We're doing some very exciting work actually at Hackensack. Again, it's not, uh, not ready for prime time. We're using something called exosomes of the prostate cancer and using that and seeing if we can deter find that in the blood or the urine to be more accurate for prostate cancer, has have more high spec specificity and sensitivity. Um, so I think I answered the question, um, but if not, um, reach out to Shar Shar, we'll try again. <laughs> Uh, um, the other thing is also, if you have questions for the doctors, I, I can, you can also send them to us and maybe we can get some of them answered afterwards. There are two that keep coming in over and over again privately to me. So the first one, I even think maybe it's for Peggy, actually. We talked a lot about genetic testing and, you know, being eligible and, and getting it for affordable prices. But what about insurance? Is, it, is there any issue with health insurance, life insurance. I saw someone posted in the thing to get your life insurance before you test. Like, can you talk a little bit about um, the risks of, for our insurance if we test, if we screen for mutations? Yes, yeah, so there is a law in place called GINA, which is Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And that really protects almost all people from having discrimination in their health insurance. So if you test positive, for a BRCA mutation, your insurance can't say, oh, now we're not gonna cover you for breast cancer or, or you know, along those lines. But other kinds of insurance like life insurance or disability or long-term care are allowed to ask questions about your health before they give you a policy. And so if you are going to have this kind of testing done, you could consider getting your insurance ducks all lined up so that you don't run into a problem afterwards. Now, it's important to mention that genetic information is not just the results of the genetic test, but it's also family history. So if you've talked about your family history with your doctor and that gets reported into the insurance company, that could be used against you as well. So it's important to remember that um, you know, to get insurance uh, when you're healthy. Um, is it that's, that's life insurance. We're not talking about it. Life insurance, life insurance, absolutely. Okay. Um, and someone put in the chat, what is cyber knife treatment? That's not- Rob, Rob, mm -hmm. Bobby. 
Um, it's uh, pretty much directed radiation therapy. Um, there are many different ways of giving radiation therapy for prostate cancer. Um, old fashioned way of doing seed implantations and external beam radiation therapy, which uh, was successful, but relatively toxic to surrounding tissues. Uh, they now moved on to something called IMRT or intensified modified radiation therapy, which is a more of a direct radiation therapy where the radiation beam is pretty much like peeling skin off an onion. It's, it's, it's that good. The next generation is tomotherapy, which sort of recalibrates where the disease is on a daily basis. And then there's proton therapy, which is using protons instead of photons. And then CyberNF is really using more of a, a, a again, a better treatment, better uh, directed therapy in a shortened course. Um, so rather than doing radiation therapy over eight to nine weeks on a five days a week basis, it can be done over five days. Um, intensified therapy, it's actually it's five treatments, not over five days, I apologize. Um, but again, it should limit the toxicities as well. And at the same time, too, it limits the patient's, um, I guess, uh, time that they have to be seen in, seen in their um, radiation suites as well as times of office visits, it gives them a little bit more flexibility and quality of life outside the, the radiation oncologist. Um, as to which uh, device may be better, a shorter beam, external beam being archaic at this point, um, there is a modest difference between all the different radiation techniques. Um, every time these questions get posed to myself, I really defer those questions to the radiation oncologists who are significantly brilliant when it comes down to answering those questions. And some sites offer some uh, treatment options and some don't. So a lot of times you may hear that they recommend one just because that's the only recommendation that they have at their center as compared to uh, other centers which may have the option of others. In which case, you know, I think that speaking to radiation oncologists are a wealth of information, but the ultimate approach is localized therapy, minimal toxicities with long-term uh, cure. Okay, uh, there's a question about a biopsy procedure, like what's the probability of actually missing a cancerous area versus, I don't yeah. know if this is even versus. So I'm, I'm going to take that one um, because this is something we do really well at Hackensack Renewed Health. And to be very transparent, I don't do the biopsies uh, for prostate cancer. My partners do, and they do a lot of them and they're really good at it. And so one of the things that we've learned is that prior to any biopsy, we get an MRI. We get a three-phase uh, MRI on a really good machine with experts reading it. And what that does is it gives us often a guide of where we should be targeting. So what we used to do is just place a probe uh, next to the prostate and just sort of hit the prostate randomly in 12 different spots and sort of hope for the best. Now what we do is we get an MRI and anyone who has any abnormality in an MRI we target that area specifically because there's a significantly higher risk that we'll find it in that area. And then on top of that, we will do the random biopsies. So what that does is number one, it helps us find the bad cancers and the ones that need to be treated. And number two, when we find the good ones, the good cancers, those lower grade cancers, we know with really good accuracy, we don't need to worry about those and we can put those patients on active surveillance. So. The technique is called MRI fusion guided biopsy. Um, we are very big proponents of that um, and most academic centers are. Um, we've got the newest technology um, to do that. And I think that's the, that's the way, that's the really the way I believe, and this is my opinion, uh, biopsy should be done in 2021. Okay. I agree, We're especially close to 2022 also, right? <laughs> yeah, I would just say, especially in the setting of doing active surveillance, I think that you really want to make sure that if you're going to be doing uh, biopsies once a year, mon monitoring the PSA as well as patient symptoms, you really want to make sure that if you're going to have one shot at, you want to be aiming as a sniper as compared to a bump shot. So I really think the MRIs are an important step in making sure the patients are appropriately monitored uh, in the active surveillance setting. Okay. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, but again, I want to emphasize that Sharsharet, this is not a one and done. We will be bringing more of these informational webinars. We'll bring resources. We have videos. We're working on this. This is an initiative and we're not going away. We are, we are here for you. We are here for your family. And I just 
want to wrap it up by saying huge thank you to Brad for sharing his story so personally. I know that I know in the chat, someone said the patient experience and, and, and Dr. Seifelman, you know, confirmed it. Brad's, his, Brad's experience really taught us a lot. I want to thank Dr. Seifelman, Dr. Alter, you know, doc, thank you, Peggy, for sharing your expertise this evening and, and Peggy for, for taking charge of the chat. There was a lot of really good questions that you were managing at the same time. Um, I want to thank our generous sponsors, um, the Department of Urologic Oncology at Hackensack Meridian Health, our lead tonight, the Basser Center for BRCA, Azai, GSK, Merck, CGEN, the Max and Anna Barron, Ben and Sarah Barron, and Milton Barron Endowment Fund of the Jewish Community Foundation of Los Angeles and Sigmund and Edith Blumenthal Memorial Fund. I really want to thank all of our partners who came on. A lot of you came from those um, emails they were sending out. We so appreciate your time. Um, and we so appreciate your collaboration. We'll continue to work with you to um, educate our community. We're putting an evaluation link into the chat. I know we've been very active on the chat. Don't stop now. Let's go into the evaluation. Your feedback is so critical as we launch this new effort to educate men in our community and beyond. So take a minute, it's gonna impact, you can actually access resources straight from the evaluation that will be helpful, informative, life-saving, life-changing. Um, and we really want your feedback. There's actually a raffle for an Amazon gift card. So just putting it out there, holidays coming, can't hurt to have an Amazon gift card. We're pushing it, we're pushing the evaluation. So please, please let us know what you think. We're not gonna get you back in a room together anytime soon, not this week anyway, but uh, so click now, you'll be able to continue listening to me. Don't worry, you can still fill it out at the same time. Um, so tonight we did have a focus on prostate cancer, thus the doctors of urology, but we are continuing the conversation. We'll keep you up to date on new information. Um, and we also, in our efforts, in the community, we have now are establishing a men's leadership council. Many of you came on the call tonight, thank you. We are working together with the council leading the way to save lives through education. We're working on a resource, a, a, actually a printed resource that will be distributed to doctors all across the country and organizations and communities uh, with a lot of what we discussed tonight and really easy uh, ways to share information and learn. Um, you can pre-order that resource through the evaluation that I'm pushing you to fill out. Um, and finally, just really remember that Sharsharet is here for you and your family, men and women. We provide emotional support, mental health counseling, financial subsidies for non-medical services, and we help you navigate the cancer journey. And that journey can start before cancer, during cancer, or even after diagnosis into the survivorship years. Everything we do is customized. It's about you. You. We don't fit the programs. We make our programs fit your needs. Everything is confidential. Everything is free. Everything is convenient. Our number is toll free, 866 474 2774. It's going in the chat. You can you'll get a copy of the transcript when we send out a recap email. It will also be posted on our website. It's on our YouTube channel. Everything you can find. You can pick up the phone and call us. We'll tell you how to get it. Um, and really don't hesitate to reach out. Many people reach out to Sharshar, don't even know why they're reaching out, but we can help. We'll figure out what you need. You don't have to do this alone. Sharshar, it's here for you. We're a community. We're going to save lives. We're going to improve lives. We're going to do it together. So thank you to our experts. Thank you to our community. Um, and to really everyone, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.